the Edgeworth Lecture, and thanks a lot for the great you know, introduction. I hope I can live up to it. <laughs> um, so let me uh, start. What I, want, I thought I will do is I will give a little bit of an overview of many of the papers I've written in the past. In particular, I also would like to give a little bit of an overview of the book, which is coming out in end of August, which I've written with uh, Harold James and Jean-Pierre Landau. And my publisher said I should distribute this thing. So if you want some, I have some. Uh, <laughs> so you want. <laughs> uh, but then I will also talk about the idea of money, uh, some debate lecture I gave last year on the financial dominance, a little bit about safe assets. And um, you see all my co-authors here in the Euronomics group. I will also talk about ASPs at the end, which some joint work I did with Philip uh, early on. So let me uh, start with this picture uh, where you see how the various countries in the Euros area did, starting when the Euro started at the base of 100. And you might be pleased to see that actually Ireland did uh, phenomenally well if you start all at the same base. While you know you have other countries, like Italy and Portugal, they actually they suffered already before the crisis. And the crisis made things even worse. And you have Greece, which moved up dramatically as well, and then came down, and is doing worse than uh, other countries, which have never done, even it didn't even have a run up. Now, what I want to say about this, I want to put this in perspective, and I would like to outline what went on during the Euro crisis in perspective, also from a little bit from a historical perspective. And the first one is I would like to show what were the watershed moments in the Euro crisis, and I will identify three watershed moments. And they also led to some power shift away from Brussels, first to the national capitals, and at the end, actually, to uh, Berlin and Paris, and ultimately, uh, to Berlin, and I would outline what, what events triggered that. Then I will talk a little bit about culture clash and between France and Germany. And the argument in this book essentially is that the battle of ideas is actually going on between France and Germany. There are two different perspectives. Of course, there's not only France and Germany. It's a very stylized way. We do it a little bit in a black and white fashion um, to make the contrast more sharp. But then I will actually outline these different economic philosophies. And the argument in the book is essentially we have to come to a common ground on these different economic philosophies. And I would like to make it very sharp, the contrast, in order to make it very clear what the differences are and how we can then achieve, perhaps, potentially, some common ground down the road. The other emphasis I would like to make is that actually these different economic philosophies, they're not written in stone. So they can shift radically after some deep crisis. And I will outline when they're shifted in, in history. And then I will be very specific about what, which dimensions the differences are. And some dimensions were already debated during the Maastricht negotiations. They concerned primarily monetary and fiscal stability. And some dimensions were not debated at all, in particular the financial stability aspects. And I will outline then with my research where these different aspects and complications come in. And I will then go through these various papers I've mentioned in the previous slide. OK, so let me start with the watershed moments or the turning points in the crisis. I think the first thing was essentially in the spring of 2010, where the, the EFSF was established, and it was decided that the IMF would be involved. And this essentially was a big step because it led to this intergovernmental arrangement. So there was not much, I mean, there was some effect coming from the Commission and from Brussels in general. But because it was arranged through the EFSF and the IMF was brought in, it led to a dramatic power shift towards the national capital. So it was all arranged intergovernmental in the ECOFIN and so forth. The main decisions were taken uh, intergovernmental. And this was a major shift away from Brussels towards the national capitals. The second power shift came then in Deauville. And this was when Angela Merkel and uh, Nicolas Sarkozy walked on the beach in Deauville. And they agreed there will be a private uh, sector involvement, so a haircut on private debt, on Greek debt. And this led to uh, contagion into a, in the other countries. So the yields were sp spiking after Deauville in the other countries as well. This is Ireland, Portugal, and Spain. And from then onwards, the political power shifted because it was very difficult for some political leaders to make some aggressive statements, knowing that if the others were 
make some aggressive statements back, the market would move against them. So it shifted the political power within the negotiations dramatically towards Paris and in Berlin, Berlin, but ultimately to Berlin, uh, because you know, the market power essentially was now on Berlin's side. The third watershed moment, well, this essentially I put together, this was a power shift, the two power shifts. Then there was the Draghi speech, whatever it takes, and we're all familiar with that, and I will come back to this very briefly. And the final uh, watershed moment, I would say, is, was the Cyprus bail-in, where there was a, a change in attitudes away from a bailout regime towards a bail-in regime, where actually debt holders have to uh, pay up uh, as well if there's restructuring. So that's, these are the various uh, watershed moments or turning points, and I think they're very important to keep in mind. And I will come back to all these elements again a little bit more formally, but uh, I think these are important, which really made a big difference to how this uh, crisis played out. So on one reason why I focus very much on France and Germany, even though the crisis was primarily you know, in the peripheral countries, but the battle of these ideas was to some extent done between France and Germany. But of course, it's not only France and Germany. There are other countries who are more Germany-like and other countries which are more French-like. But I just want to make it very sharp in these two dimensions. And the reason why I focus on on different countries is because everything shifted intergovernmental. So it was not centralized, organized. It was really some exchange um, of uh, arguments at the intergovernmental level. And for this, we have to really uh, then see what is going on. The argument in the book is also that not only interests played a role, primarily uh, the ideas played a role as well. What's the ideology or the economic philosophy behind that? And that played a key role uh, because whenever you decide whether something is beneficial or not beneficial, you do this um, through the lens of your ideology or through the lens of your ideas. Yeah. Let me outline these differences. And let me first go back when these differences already budgeted in 1869, wrote already there might be two types of money, Teutonic money and Latin money. Uh, so this goes back, this difference in attitudes goes back quite some while. So here are the four aspects, what I call this Rhine divide between the French way of looking at things and the German way of looking at things. Again, this is in quotation marks, meaning that it's not really only the French or it's only the German way of looking at things. Uh, but that's, uh, I think, one way to divide these things. And the first thing is, the first four of them I will go through, they are actually came already up during the Maastricht negotiations. That's not something which was overlooked. Then I will move on later on to the aspects which were overlooked, what are called the Maastricht stepchild, the financial stability in the banking sector was not fully you know, taken into account. The first thing is a famous discretion versus rules. The French think you know, discretion is uh, typically a better way to deal with the crisis. You want to have some flexible crisis management where the Germans are very rigid with their rules. And then I will talk about solidarity versus liability. Um, so the fiscal union aspect versus the no bailout clause, you're liable if something goes wrong in your country, there's a no bailout clause, you have to deal with that. Whenever you're in doubt whether it's liquidity or solvency problems, in, from the French perspective, it's always a liquidity problem because contagion might make things even worse. I will just highlight a little bit uh, how one can view that. From the German perspective, when in doubt, it's always a solvency problem. And it's never black and white. It's always gray, but when in doubt, one group is tending in this direction, the other group is tending in the other direction. And then there's, of course, a lot of debate between the Keynesian stimulus aspects versus austerity uh, and reform efforts uh, pushed by the German side. So let me first say something. When I talk about discretion versus rules, you might think, oh, that's forever. It was very much the case because discretion makes sense in, in, a, in a state where everything is very centralized. You know? Like in France, it's much more centralized. Germany is a federal uh, republic, so it's very much federal. So you need ex ante rules rather exposed. You can't do much because in order to get some, to some agree agreement across the people and across the states, it's much more difficult. If you have a centralized power, like a French president, or King Louis or so forth, then you can intervene ex post very quickly, so you would like to have a lot of flexibility uh, on this side. But it was indeed the case, if you look back, uh, that 
before the Second World War, there was actually much more uh, rule-driven and much more laissez-faire, less you know, rigid behavior on the French side, as, which is consistent with that, but also a much more centralized power, and you know, the Nazis centralized everything uh, very much. So it only happened, um, there was of course a little school, economic school, the order liberalist school in Germany. When the Allies came afterwards, they were very much favorable to the order liberal school because it, one of their philosophies is to decentralize power. Okay, to promote competition, have clear rules, and rules should be such that to decentralize powers. And when the Allies took over Germany, it was very favorable to their philosophy, said, oh, let's decentralize everything and not have any, anything concentration of power in Berlin. And that's what this took off, and then it was a Wirtschaftswunder that they got, the Germans got very attached to this uh, framework because it worked very well, and it also seemed to be a decentralized session of power, nobody has some discretion at the end. Once you have discretion at the end, it always depends who has the best lobbying power to you know, uh, get the discretion. So political economy aspects play a, a big role in the German arguments. So what happened is, with, in the Second World War, in Germany essentially, it moved very much to a rule-driven framework, even though before that, it had actually um, very much a cameralistic system, and it had very much st state order, and it was very centralized, especially at the extreme with, with the Nazis, they centralized everything. But it was just a sharp switch uh, coming after the Second World War. Now, that's what I would like to convey. These differences in philosophies are not written in stone. They can actually change, okay? So there's hope in a sense that we can find some common ground what the philosophy should be, we should follow. On the other extreme, in France, before the crisis, it was not always that France was very much pro-stimulus, pro-planning, and so forth. It was very much less fair uh, before the crisis. It also had a little bit of austerity before the Second World War, and that's why they did initially in the Second World War so poorly. And that led to a shift after the Second World War to much more planning, much more centralized intervention, and also exposed, you can intervene much more if you have much more centralized planning. And this led to a dramatic shift also in 1945 in France. Again, you can see in both countries, they actually almost switch sides. Okay? So it doesn't need to be that this is written in stone. It actually can very much change sides uh, as we go along. So that's one main message we would like to convey, is that you know, there are differences in economic philosophies, but they're not forever, and they can change, and they have changed. Uh, and this way, it's also possible to find some common ground down the road. So let me go a little bit uh, through these four points in more detail. And as I, get, as I said before, it's a little bit of a black and white. It's an organizing principle. So we would like to have it a sharper contrast. Of course, the real world is gray, so it's never black and white. So when, when you talk to policymakers in France, it is mostly, you know, they like discretion, they like flexible crisis management. You would very flexibly react to this. Well, when you talk to people in, in Germany, they consider this ad, as ad hocery. So you have some exams, some rules, and even in the crisis, you don't change the rules. If you were to change it, it's an ad hocery uh, thing, and you don't essentially have some clear guidance, or the population or the market participants don't have a clear guidance how the government will react if you walk into a crisis. So of course, it, we're all very familiar with this. It's, the problem with flexibility is this time inconsistency. So ex ante was exposed. So exposed, you would like to be very flexible and adjust to the circumstances. But of course, from an ex ante perspective, you'd like to commit not to do that, to follow strict rules, because then you can actually guide the market participants uh, and their beliefs will change accordingly. Otherwise, there's no trustworthy uh, relationship. Uh, in a sense that if they know you will say something and expose you will because of your flexibility, you will change uh, your uh, behavior later on. Now you see this in many dimensions. You see this in monetary policy. You have this promise not to inflate in the future. That's where this time of consistency was pointed out the first time. We're all familiar with that. But you also have it with respect to financial stability. You promise only to provide liquidity, but not to bail out or redistribute insolvent institutions. But when you get there, and then the spillovers might be so large or something, you might change your mind, you might do something differently. 
And the same thing is true for fiscal debt sustainability. So here are the three stability concepts I will walk through, price stability, financial stability, and fiscal debt sustainability. So you want to promise not to default on debt only in extreme circumstances and uh, to, to spend in recessions now, but then consolidate later when you're out of the recession. But essentially, it's not time consistent. When you get there, you will actually not do what you promised. Okay, that's where this time consistency problem comes in. And that's why we have these clear rules, and that's why we have fiscal councils uh, trying to enforce the latter and so forth. Now, so rules have essentially a role to play in a sense that you would like to fix these commitment problems through a rule, so through some uh, uh, arrangement. The problem is, of course, you can't have some very rigid rules because there are always some unforeseen contingencies. And here Aristotle ever even said this, that sometimes you might be, something might be coming up which you have never thought about, and hence it's an unforeseen contingency. And the answer Aristotle gave is that, oh, what would the person have said if he would have known at that time this contingency? And that's one way to go forward. So one way to to deal with this unforeseen contingency rules is one outcome, by very rigid rules, but that's too rigid because you can't cover this unforeseen contingency. Another way is essentially some delegation, some institutional design. Okay, and that's essentially what uh, is part of the German philosophy too, was what's adopted for the ECB, is to have this in, um, independent central bank. So if you split the government into two authorities, in the fiscal authority in a central bank, which is independent now, uh, there will be a great central bankers, and you let them play a game of chicken. You sp after the a government is split into two units, they play a game of chicken, and then, you know, depending who dominates, you have either fiscal dominance and the fiscal authority dominance, dominates, and then the central bank has to give in. So the fiscal authority is in the driver's seat and central bank has to give in, might lead to inflation. Or you have a monetary dominance where then the central bank is in the driver's seat and the fiscal authority has to give in. The central bank is hiking interest rates and makes it difficult for the government to fund other expenditures. So the government has to essentially cut back on their expenditures under monetary dominance. What I did, also I introduced this concept of financial dominance. So what do I mean by financial dominance? Financial dominance is where the financial sector has some power as well. And the paradox with the financial dominance is that um, the weaker the financial sector is, the more power it has. Okay. So when you enter in a financial crisis, there are some losses to be allocated. And you have to figure out whom to push the losses to. Okay. If you have a very healthy financial sector, then some of these losses will be pushed towards the financial sector. Probably rightly so, because the financial sector might have created these problems in the first place. So what the incentive for the financial sector essentially is, before the crisis starts, just to pay out a lot of dividends and make itself weak, because then you cannot push losses uh, onto the financial sector. How do you push losses on the financial sector? You can, for example, say that you know, foreclosure is much easier to do or more difficult to do. You can vary the, the foreclosure rules such that the financial sector suffers from that. And you can see from, from this perspective, the financial sector has a strategic incentive to be weak in crisis. And that's uh, what gives its additional uh, dominance uh, in this framework. And then, of course, this financial dominance leads to the second game of chicken. If you have to recapitalize uh, the banking sector, you can do it in two ways. You can either do it through the fiscal authorities, so you recapitalize the, the financial sector, or you can also do it through the central banks. And I will go to this redistributive monetary policy. Some, to some extent, central banks affect asset prices, and you can affect asset prices in such a way which strengthens or helps the financial sector. Okay? But of course, there is a battle between the fiscal authorities and the central bank going on, a second game of chicken, which is different. It's all about recapitalizing the financial sector. The, the strategically weaken the financial sector, uh, and it's, it's essentially between these two authorities as well. So essentially what we have, we have two uh, games of chicken going on, uh, one with the, the traditional one between the fiscal authority and the central bank, how to you know, cut back on the expenditures in order to keep inflation low, 
And the second one is between who should recapitalize essentially the financial sector. Now, so that's all what I wanted to say about rules versus discretion. Essentially, the German side is much more rule driven. The French side wants to act more reflexively towards a crisis. And this played out big time during the crisis in many, many circumstances. And one way to enforce this rule or make them more flexible is to delegate. So delegation is a way to overcome this timing consistency problem uh, and have you know, a certain institutional framework, which leads to some a game of chicken, which is in design this way. It's a mechanism design. Is you design it in a way in order to overcome this time and consistency problem. Now, the second thing is solidarity versus liability. And that played out, uh, you know, for example, also uh, during the Deauville aspect. So on the one hand, you have the French side and the peripheral countries pushing for a fiscal union while uh, the Germans very much insisting on the no bailout clause, which is essentially a rule, uh, essentially that the central authorities or no EU member can bail out some other EU member. Uh, that was written in the Maastricht negotiation. It's an international treaty, so it's a very powerful law. And the idea was essentially to have on the one hand, you have the Stability and Growth Pact as a rule driven for fiscal uh, aspects, and you have, on the other hand, you offer market discipline because of this no bailout. This, if a country gets into difficulties or will down the road go into difficulties, ideally it should be reflected in, in the prices, so there will be some market discipline. Of course, markets are never fully efficient, so it's problematic that this might not work. The other aspect is, if you think of, uh, from a French perspective, there's always a desire not to default on bonds. So they always keep bonds risk-free. And I will come back to this in particular in connection with bank regulation, how important this played out. While from a German perspective, the side switched, but it's as much more open as to some insolvency procedure for governments. And, and I've shown you this graph already, how this spillovers can, can occur. So this also played out in terms of you know, support of euro bonds with joint liability or without joint liability. The Germans would, they were very resistant to have, or they're still uh, very opposed to any form of euro bonds. Perhaps they might be open to something. I will come back to the, like ESPs, which has, is, has no joint liability. So it's, it does it without joint liability. I mentioned already the third dimension we contrasted to is the liquidity contagion versus uh, the solvents perspective. If in doubt, the German side will always say, there's a solvency problem. Uh, we have to you know, fix the solvency problem, fundamentally go down and fix the solvency problem. While from a French perspective, it's much more a liquidity problem. And why, there are two ways to see liquidity problems. One is a multiple equilibrium problem, a la Diamond and Depec. Okay, or many, we have many, many models. Uh, so you have some price, you have some supply, just draw very simply a vertical supply, and then there's this demand curve. You can have a good equilibrium with a high price and a bad equilibrium with a low price. And you just come out with your big bazooka that came out of the UK, so you just stand there ready, and then the equilibrium will jump from the bad price to the high price. This middle one is unstable. Let's just focus on the two stable equilibrium. And, and that's essentially what was debated uh, big time through the whole when the EFSF and the ESM, the size of the EFSF on the ESM, how big should, should it be, is it big enough, uh, and came out. And then there also played a major role uh, how to interpret the Draghi speech. Okay, so when Mario Draghi gave the speech in London, this famous whatever it takes speech, you can see that um, that the yields came down. So the speech was here on 25th of July 2000, or 26th of July 2012. And you see how the yields came down over the subsequent months. It didn't jump down right to the new equilibrium. And also, all the other yields came down as well. So the question is how to interpret this when you ask somebody from the left column to say it's a clear sign of multiple equilibria. If you ask some German economists, they would say, yeah, it's of course because of OMT provided a guarantee, and hence because there was a guarantee on uh, these government bonds. Um, 
then the, the yield will come down. So it was nothing than just a government a, a guarantee provided by the ECB. Now let me move a little bit further into this liquidity interpretation um, because you can also have liquidity without uh, this multiplicity. So if, if I look at this demand curve, it's like this inverted S shape. If I make it a little bit less extreme, then it can look something like this. And you can see as I shift the supply curve, the price moves, I mean an epsilon shift will make a, a large price move shift here. So um, multiple equilibria and amplification are close cousins of each other. So multiple equilibria is like the strategic complementarity is just more pronounced in multiple equilibria. It's less, a little bit less pronounced here, and then you have actually amplification. Or put it differently, in multiple equilibrium setting, I don't have to change anything about fundamentals, and I can jump from a high price to a low price, because they're two different equilibria, without changing any fundamental parameters. Um, so that's why in the multiple equilibrium, <coughs> while if I'm amplification, I have to change this a little bit on epsilon, and I have dramatic changes in the price. <coughs> now the question is, when is it worthwhile to inject some money, do some bailout? And it could be, you know, that you use government money if it has is a positive expected NPV project. So I'm, even though it costs the government something, but the whole economy is doing so much better that it's actually worthwhile uh, to do if it's a positive NPV project. And then it comes very much, so the net present value of a bailout is very much the present value of the bailout minus the present value of the no bailout. And what is actually you know, the cost of not bailing out, if you think there's a lot of contagion, a lot of systemic risk, then actually this is a huge number, and hence the expected value of, of the net present value of a bailout is, is, is uh, larger than zero. And if you have an interpretation that you know, everything links to a huge bailout, uh, leads to a huge contagion and systemic risk, you would always be in this liquidity interpretation rather than the solvency interpretation. And that's where the, the third watershed moment, the Cyprus element, came in. There was a big debate uh, on the one hand, should we do a bailout or not? And, and essentially, the Germans were very insistent, saying even uh, that you know, if Cyprus is a systemic case, then anything is systemic because you know, mostly of the funds came from Russian oligarchs and so forth, and if the German taxpayers or European taxpayers have to bail it out, uh, that, you know, then anything is systemic, so the, no the Nobela clause has no bite whatsoever. And this made a, a big uh, shift during the Cyprus towards bail-in, uh, while here is you know, the bail-out in land of last resort. Um, this applies to countries and also financial sector, but it played out big time in the debate uh, for Cyprus. Now this, the debate is a little bit more complicated as we all follow uh, these events. It is the case that you know, there was, in Italy, it's much more tricky, and there's also uh, an issue about financial literacy. So you have certain populations who buy some bail-inable bonds, but they're not aware that these are risky bonds. And this, you know, some, some pensioner committed suicide because he bought some of the bonds and lost all his savings. Uh, and it's, it's a much more tricky issue than simply saying it's bail-in or bail-out. So one has to fine-tune uh, these things and also combine it with financial literacy. So, but you can see already here discretion, solidarity, and liability. Liquidity and contagion with solvency, that's another big dimension where the two schools essentially differ to a large extent. Now, the, the final thing which uh, already came up uh, in the Maastricht negotiations was this Keynesian demand management or demand stimulus. Whenever you have an output gap, uh, then you would like to put uh, some fiscal stimulus in order to uh, stimulate the economy, while the Germans are very much uh, focused on the supply side. Of course, they don't ignore fully the supply at the demand side. And it's also, there's, it's not black and white again. There's also Keynesians in Germany uh, being more on this side, but of course, it's the majority, I would say, is uh, more on the supply dimension. So what's uh, the big difference? If you listen to some speeches by some panel discussion with Larry Summers and uh, Wolfgang Schäuble, is 
when, is, when should you do reforms in good times or in bad times? So the, the Keynesian philosophy is it's much easier to do reforms in, in good times. So when the economy is booming, there are some surpluses, you can restructure things and you can do reforms when everything is going extremely well. Um, and then you do you know, some fundamental structural reforms which then help you in the long run to sustain the growth path much longer. The German perspective, and it comes also from historical experience, is notice that you, know, you can only do structural reforms when you are in a downturn. Because the political economy is such that only in bad times you can really push through some structural reforms. So even though austerity and structural reforms are two independent things, one is just spending money and the other one is you know, to restructure uh, things, it seems like the political economy connects these two things. On the German side, it's very much of the view that you know, only in downturns you can actually make these uh, big differences. So some fundamental structural reforms. While uh, the Keynesian side, to do the structural reforms, it's easier done in boom when there's some surpluses you can share uh, among. In particular, you can compensate the ones which are losing out. Now let me, so you might say, okay, I'm focusing too much about within Europe, the French perspective in a broader sense and the German perspective in, a, in another broader sense. How is the French perspective the same as the Anglo-American, so the UK and the US perspective? Uh, what is the difference there? So we, have, we go into this as well. So indeed, I mean, the French view is close to the uh, US perspective, but there are some very important differences. So one is that the role of the government in the US is very different compared to in France. It's, there's no, in France, it's the French planning, the government is always involved in good times and bad times. In the US, it is mostly, you need the government moving in when there's a crisis, okay? But when in good times, it moves out again. And the other big difference is that, what, how do you see uh, debt in, uh, in continental Europe or in France, it is mostly the case that you, know, you would like to have default-free debt. Uh, you, you rule out default as much as possible, while in the US or so in Anglo-American setting, it is, debt is seen as a contingent uh, instrument. So you can smooth out things. So having a contingent debt contract is part of an insurance contract. If things go really badly, you can default on it, and then you can restart again and you start your next business or you start new things. So that is a contingent contract and helps you to ensure and share risk uh, across uh, investors. There's of course also a difference between the Anglo-American thinking and the German view. Um, as I mentioned already, it's, it's primarily with regard to when you should do reforms in booms or in crises. That's where the political economy difference comes in. And of course the cutoff one agreement one has to find, if you go for contingent debt, when should there be a default? How extreme should these circumstances be? So you can have, you know, you can default all the time, or you can default never, you have a straight jacket commitment, or you have some particular, you have to agree on a cutoff, say, okay, this, in these extreme circumstances, there should be a default because the economy is not getting back on its feet and it's not possible uh, to grow again. So there should be some restructuring, and one has to define ex ante, in, at least in rough terms, we have to find some agreement under which states of the world, under which circumstances do you would like to have some restructuring, and under which circumstances you commit not to default at all. Now let me move on to the other elements, the elements about financial stability, which were not so emphasized in the Maastricht negotiations, because mostly it was about price stability and uh, fiscal uh, debt sustainability, and, and I will go through these uh, points a little bit more in detail. But now I need some financial sectors, so I have to enlarge the model a little bit and talk about the financial sector. So this is a, a sketch of the I theory of money I've worked with Yuli Sanikov on, and that's uh, how the economy looks like. So you have some sector here, you have some banking sector in between, and you have some other sector here. So you can think of these guys 
they hold some physical assets, they're producing something, you have your own home production or whatever going on, and you also save in form of money, and the money is primarily, you know, these are deposits from the banking sector. There's also some outside money, that's where the I comes from, it comes from intermediation or inside money. So there is some money created by the banks, that's this inside money, and there's also some outside money, that's some money created by the government. Okay? That's this outside money. You can think of gold, or you can also think of reserves, and later I will think of these outside money as reserves, they also pay interest. And outside money and inside money, they have the same expected returns and the same ex you know, risk profile, so they are totally, in terms of returns, they're identical. Of course, there are different things. One is created by the banking sector inside the economy, and one is actually coming from outside the, from the economy, from the government. So that's a simplified bank's balance sheet, and the banks have some risky claims, some risky loans to this sector, and this sector also has some machines running to produce something, and they also hold some money, so they also hold some of this money, and they hold risky claims. So what we assume in this paper, we assume there's certain financial frictions. There's an incubated market in the sense that these guys, these are many of these guys, and there are many of these guys, they cannot diversify across each other. So each firm essentially, is, each mom and pop shop is his own shop, okay? And I cannot buy a little share of my neighboring mom and pop shop or in the whole country. I just run my own little business and I'm exposed to this risk, okay? I can pass on some of this risk to the banks and the banks can diversify. So that's what the banks can do and I cannot do. The banks have better technology to diversify across the whole country all these little idiosyncratic risks. Okay? There's also aggregate risk, they can't diversify away, but idiosyncratic risk, they can diversify away. And I cannot do it, I have to hold some equity, and, but some of this risk I can pass on to the banks and the banks can then diversify this and that's what the banks are good at. But then there are the bankers have some net worth which protects this inside money, so it makes this risk free which is then held by these guys and also to some extent by these guys. So that's how the economy looks like. Uh, and that's a stylized economy. And let's just look through the economy and highlight certain effects. So what I want to show is this financial instability. The financial instability is driven by two amplification mechanisms, two spirals, and I want to highlight how these spirals work in a world where there's no central bank. Okay, the central bank is totally passive. Think of the Great uh, Depression in the 1930s where the central bank is largely uh, inactive and what would happen then, okay? So what I will do is I will shock this sector and say, okay, there's a negative shock on this, and then it could be a small shock, but then it, it's amplified to a much more dramatic large shock and I will show why this is the case. So let me come back. So what we have here, here money is more or less a store of value. It's a, it's a vehicle to save for a period or two, for a short period. Uh, it doesn't really have a, you know, a transaction role or a unit of account. We could add this to the model, but it doesn't, it's not the, the, the key aspect. So why do we focus on the transaction role of money, uh, on the store of value? you will see that what happens if there's a negative shock, there will be actually deflationary pressure, okay? If you have a model where money is in the utility function and there's a transaction role of money, if there's a negative shock and GDP drops and money supply stays fixed, there will be inflationary pressure, okay? In our setting, it will be deflationary pressure because we focus on the store of value and we think over the cycle, the store of value aspect is actually the more important one. And as I mentioned before, Bankers have this, they are diversifiers. They can better diversify idiosyncratic risk than individual mom and pop shops can. Okay, so you pass on some of this risk to the bank and they have many, many mom and pop shops and they can actually diversify across them. Now, what are these amplification mechanisms or these endogenous risk dynamics? There are two. If there's a negative shock to this uh, borrowing sector, there will be a liquidity spiral and this liquidity spiral will actually lead to a decline in the value of capital. Think of capital machines or houses or real capital, or it can be also th some claims towards output of this capital. So there will be fire sales and there will be flight to safety, and this is the liquidity spiral on the asset side of the bank's balance sheet. But there's a second spiral, that's a disinflationary spiral, a la Fischer. I call it disinflation because it's not, it's 
a lower inflation relative to expected inflation. So it's this inflation, uh, not the inflation need not be negative. So even if you know you expect two percent and you undershoot it because you have only half a percent, that's also this inflation. And the value of money will rise, which means there's this inflation or deflation even, for two reasons. One, and we will see that the banks will actually create less inside money. And you saw this a big time in the Great Depression. The banks were bankrupt, and hence they didn't create all the demand deposits. So total money supply was shrinking. So money supply was shrinking. On top of it, the demand for money rises. Okay? So what happens if the banks shrink their business? It means they produce less inside money. But it also means that each individual mom and pop shop cannot offload its risk to the bank. Okay? So they have to hold the risk on their own. And because the individuals cannot diversify across things like the bank can, so if the banks are constrained and they cannot diversify risk away, this risk has to be borne in the economy. So people have to hold this risk. And then people who have to hold more risk, they are shift their portfolio towards cash holding. Okay? The demand for money is actually going up. So let's suppose before that I was holding 60% physical capital, 40% cash, and everything was fine. I could sell off a lot of my risk to the bank. I offloaded some of this risk to the bank. Now I can't do this anymore. But then actually I will not have 60%, 40%. I might move to 50, 50%, so 50% cash and 50% real investment. And hence there's more demand because now I want to hold from move up from 40% to 50% cash holding, there's more demand for cash. Okay, there's more demand for money. At the same time, the banks create less money, so there's more scarcity in money, so the value of money is going up. Value of money going up means disinflation. Okay. So let me walk this in, in four steps, just slowly, what happens if there's a negative shock. So the first step out of the four is that there's a negative shock on this deposit of of course, it will also hit these risky claims. Some of these guys uh, will not pay back fully their loans. So that's essentially hitting the banks as well here. Okay? So let's suppose this goes down by 10%, or let's say even only 5%. Given that the bankers are leveraged, the inside money is not changing, the debt, debt stays the same. So the net worth might go down by 50%. Okay? So you lose 5% on the assets, but you lose, in terms of equity or net worth, the bankers lose 50% of the net worth. Okay? So if nothing happens, that will be the first step. There's initial shock. There will be decline in the risky claims. There will be a much, in percentage terms, a much more, a bigger decline in net worth or equity. And that, that will be it. But if you have this, you see that now the bankers are way more leveraged, okay? because they lost 50% you know, of the net worth. So now the, the leverage ratio will be much higher if you just take these old things relative to the net worth. Now you still, the green area is almost the same size. It's 5% smaller. But now the net worth went down by 50%. And that's where the, the problem comes in. Now the bankers start to delever. Okay, they try to shrink their balance sheet. They try to shrink the balance sheet. And this has two implications. One, they don't extend so many loans anymore to this sector, and this sector has to fire sell the assets at a low price, so prices will go down further. So when these, because the banking sector is not extending these risky claims anymore to this sector, because of the fire sales, the price will decline, and because the price is declining, that's the third step. Okay? The price will decline, then the value of the machines will go down further, there are additional losses, and this leads to additional losses here, which leads to additional losses on the net worth. Okay? That's a liquidity spiral. So that's the third step. But when they delever, they delever not only on the asset side, but also on the liability side. And that essentially means they create less inside money. So this was the old inside money, this whole blue box. Now we have much less inside money. And this means because there's less money supply, this means there is actually value of money is going up. So in real terms, this inside money is expanding, which hits the net worth again. So the third step was hitting the net worth, was eroding more net worth. And the fourth step, because liabilities expand in real value, hits the net worth again. So the banks are hit on both sides of the balance sheet, on the asset side, because of the liquidity spiral, and on the liability side, because of this disinflationary spiral. Okay? 
And, and this disinflationary spiral comes for two reasons. One is that the bankers create less inside money as in aggregate. And it is also the case that these guys now, they want to hold more money because this, this whole thing is more risky. They cannot offload so much risky. They want to shift the portfolio more into money. So there's more demand for money coming here too. Both of these forces push for a higher value of money, which means to get there, you have to have deflation or disinflation. So that's what I mentioned before, uh, there's this amplification. So you have this value of capital declines due to the liquidity spiral, and the value of money rises to this inflationary spiral. And that's done in, in a framework which everything solves. The value of capital and the value of money, they're both endogenously solved with the whole risk profile and everything. Now, what I wanted to say is that the whole amplification comes, as I mentioned before, becomes only because these bankers start to fire sell the thing, or the bankers stop lending, they shrink their balance sheet. If they wouldn't do this, then the whole system would only have suffered the initial fundamental shock. There would be no amplification going on. And this is, has some reminiscence of this Keynesian paradox of thrift, and that's why I would like to get this across. So it's the Keynesian paradox of thrift, that's what we teach our undergrads, is that oh, I have to save more, there's a negative shock, I want to save more. Because I save more, I give less income to the guys I typically buy my consumption from, so they have less income. At the end, everybody tries to save more, but ultimately everybody saves in aggregate less. So individually, we all try to save more, but because the saving reduces total output, reduces total income for others, in aggregate, in total, it will be the case that total saving is actually going down. That's this paradox of thrift. And we have something similar here, just not in terms of levels, but in terms of risk. And we call this uh, the paradox of prudence. And it goes the following. So it's in risk terms. Each bank tries to delever and become micro-prudent. Okay? So you reduce your risk and you become more prudent. But by reducing risk, you induce these fire sales and you also induce the disinflationary spirals. And both of it make them lead to much bigger amplification, so it makes the whole economy much more risky. Okay? So even though each individual bank tries to be very micro-prudent and try to react to that in, in a micro-prudent way, it makes the whole economy much more volatile because the whole economy is, is, has a much more endogenous risk and is, uh, you know, leads to these amplification mechanisms. Okay? So it's the same thing as the paradox of thrift. We call it just the paradox of prudence, but it's just not in levels, but it's in risk. Okay? And it's the same if you act very micro-prudent, it might be macro-imprudent. Okay? Because it leads to more endogenous macro-risk. Again, but it's the same dimension on the individual basis versus the aggregate basis, uh, fallacy composi composition aspect. Now, so that's what I want to say if there's no central bank. And what I want to do is I would like to introduce a safe asset now. Okay? I make the balance sheet of the banks a little bit more difficult. I just add some safe asset here. Okay? What's a safe asset, you might say? That's some work I did with Valentina Dad. Uh, uh, we call a safe asset is like a good friend. It is there. He is there when you need him or it. Okay? That's a safe asset. And uh, meaning it's there, it means it's liquid, it has a high price when you really need it, okay? So it, a safe asset is something, when you go in a crisis, the value goes up, like the US Treasury, or you know, German Bund or something. So it goes up in value when the crisis comes, and then you can easily sell it, everybody would like to buy it. That's, that's a safe asset. It's not a risk-free asset. A risk-free asset means it doesn't move in price. A safe asset might even appreciate in price. So to some extent, gold is a safe asset. If really everything goes sour, people will run into gold, and then uh, uh, it will appreciate in value. Even though fundamentally has nothing changed. The fundamental value of gold for jewelry or for teeth or something has not changed. It's an endogenous value changing. So wouldn't it be nice to have such a safe asset where I said, whenever we make some, we lose something on these risky claims, we will make gains, capital gains on the safe asset. No? This would be stabilizing tremendously. Okay, so that's what we need. We just have to put in some safe asset, 
And whenever we make losses on the risky claims and leads to all this amplification, liquidity spiral and disinflationary spiral, everything becomes worse and worse. We just, whenever there's a negative shock on the risky claims, we want a positive shock on the safe asset. And what I'm arguing is that US government bond, or sorry, default-free government bonds, long-term bonds, mixed with the appropriate monetary policy, are doing exactly that, okay? They essentially say, whenever we have a negative aggregate shock, on these risky claims, we increase the value of some safe asset of these government bonds and recapitalize the banks. Okay, and that's what monetary policy does in this framework. It doesn't work like in a new, it's a very different framework from the New Keynesian framework, but New Keynesian framework, it works all through price and wage rigidities. Here there's no price or wage rigidity at all. It's all about having some undercapitalized sector and you would like to recapitalize the sector. It's not about the consumer oil equation and substitution effects. I cut into nominal interest rates because prices are sticky. I cut the real interest rates, and now I bring consumption forward. Here it's all about there's the banking sector or some other sector which is undercapitalized. Because it's undercapitalized, I want to shift asset prices to recapitalize the sector. Okay. Now, how does monetary policy work? It's a redistributive monetary policy exposed. So you have the safe assets, these long-term government bonds. And what you do is, the way to best see it, you have this long-term government bond, it pays 5%. Every year it pays 5% nominal uh, on interest. And then you have the short-term money, this outside money, think of this as reserves and pay interest on reserves, like the deposit rate in the corridor of the ECB. If I cut the deposit rate from 3% to 1%, the, the long-term bonds will gain in value. Okay, so what the, the monetary authority will do is, whenever there's a negative shock on these risky claims, and it's an aggregate negative shock on these risky claims, then we cut the interest rate, and then the safe assets, the long-term government bond, will appreciate in value. Anything long-term will appreciate in value. Okay, so I counteract the negative shock with a positive shock. Okay, so from this perspective, monetary policy essentially is a recapitalization tool. We call it stealth recapitalization because it's recapitalization which is, is done in a sneaky way. You know? It's not done in the open. You could also recapitalize the banks through fiscal measures, but it's easier to do it through this recapitalization. Now, you might say, what does this framework tell you differently what, uh, what the New Keynesian framework doesn't tell you? It gives you some indication, let's suppose, the banking sector is in difficulties, but another sector is in difficulties as well. Like in the US, it was the housing sector which is difficult. It gives you some indication how you do design QE measures. So it would, for example, say if, if the housing sector is in difficulties and is balance sheet impaired, you would like to reduce mortgage rates. So QE should focus on mortgage rates and then you know, push up house prices, and this recapitalizes the housing sector. If you were to do QE in Japan in the 1990s, where the corporate sector was actually in difficulties, you would not buy mortgage products, you would buy corporate bonds, okay? because you would like to recapitalize the corporate sector. Okay? So it has different implications depending where the bottleneck is. So the way you conduct monetary policy based on this framework, you look in the economy, which sectors are balance sheet impaired, and then you make wealth transfers, and then you shift wealth in the sector which is balance sheet impaired. Now you might say, oh, this is a radical thing that they're shifting wealth around. That sounds like fiscal policy. We just call it a stealth uh, way of doing things. But we show in the model that it actually can be Pareto improving. Okay? So it can be that if you recapitalize, you take some wealth away from one sector and give it to another sector, even the sector which, from whom you took the wealth away might be better off. Okay? Because once you redistribute, you have one sector which is crucial to the economy for example, the financial sector, is not functioning well. It drags the whole economy down, so you redistribute some of the wealth. If the economy gets back on its feet, actually, even the sector where it took wealth away from is actually better off. Okay? So it can be a Pareto improvement. Of course, um, from an ex-ante perspective, so I was talking just when you're in a crisis, so exposed, from an ex-ante perspective, uh, it's an insurance. So whenever there's a negative shock and we go in a crisis, then 
Through interest rate cuts or QE measures, we will shift wealth into the sectors which are in difficulties. And, before, and if you're a positive shock, then actually we take wealth away because we raise interest rates. Okay. So from an ex-ante perspective, you can see this as an insurance mechanism. And that's indeed what it is. It steps in for some missing markets. There's some incomplete markets. As I said earlier, you know, banks are better diversifiers. In rules, we cannot diversify so well. So it, it closes some of these markets or completes some of the markets which are missing otherwise. But of, like any insurance, it comes with a moral hazard problem. So people or banks, for example, might take too much risk. Okay? And that's where you want to bring in the macroprudential regulation ex ante to make sure you know, that uh, there's not too much risk taking ex ante. What does this mean? If you have a better macroprudential regulation, you can be more aggressive in your monetary policy exposed when a crisis occurs. Because you can say, okay, we have very strict macroprudential regulation, but if a crisis occurs, I can move very aggressively on my monetary policy side because I can recapitalize the banks because they couldn't take advantage, or there was no moral hazard problem from an ex-ante perspective. So it essentially provides also a, a, a rationale for this macroprudential regulation. Now, the safe asset, I said, is a default-free long-term government bond. Okay? So now I want to move to the next step. So if, if you have a default-free long-term government bond, then it is the case that you know, this is a nice tool. We can do this. So we redistribute wealth through changing asset prices, short-term money versus long-term default-free government bond. By changing the interest rate on the short-term money, I change the relative value of these two assets, and I can recapitalize the banking sector or whatever sector is necessary to be recapitalized. Now, on the other hand, I said I would like to have, in extreme circumstances, it is actually necessary to have some restructuring of debt. Otherwise, this country will never get out of the problems anymore. Okay? So there's some tension there. Do you want a default-free bond, which is a better than tool to do conduct monetary policy, or do you want to have some defaultable bond, which gives some risk sharing in extreme circumstances, very, very extreme circumstances, like it was in Greece, where they say, I need some restructuring in order for the country to get back on its feet. Okay? Otherwise, it doesn't help anybody. And that's essentially where the German view and the, and the French view come back here. The French view essentially is, and that's also the ECB view, is never default. You just commit to a, a straight jacket commitment. The German view is much more uh, you default in extreme circumstances. But it has implications that if this is the case, then actually uh, you want to limit the bank's sovereign risk taking. Here, you want to load up on the solvent risk taking by the banks because you can actually use the banks as a hostage. I have to running severely late, I think. Is this correct? How much more time do I have? Okay, so let me speed up a little bit. Um, so let me introduce a little toy model which illustrates this point. So let's just suppose you, you, start, you have some, you have to refinance some outstanding debt, and you have some, at time two, there realizes some, you know, how much GDP you will have or how much primary surplus you have, and let's for simplicity assume it's, it's, uh, it's uniformly distributed, your tax revenue. And, and then you have to decide whether to repay your debt or you impose, uh, if, in order to repay your debt, you might have to impose extra austerity measures or do extra taxes to cover the shortfall, which might be very costly, or you might default. So let me uh, just illustrate this in this simple example. So that's a debt, this is my payoff between zero and one normalized. It's uniformly distributed, my tax revenue. And I can pledge it. Uh, if I have a face value of this, I can pledge this ideally. So that's uh, what's going on. If, if I fall short, if, I may, if my tax revenue is only this and my face value is this, so it's above the 45 degree, then I will default on it. So my default region is this region. And the default probability, if this whole area is one, this will be my default probability. Okay. Um, now let me assume I have contingent debt 
and I will default on this, but once I default, there's still some haircut, there's still some recovery value, so it will be the case that I can uh, pay something out, but there will be some verification costs, so there's some bankruptcy cost, something is lost here. Okay. So essentially what I can pledge from today's perspective, where I don't know yet what X will be, is this area underneath here. And there will be some partial default, so I promise to, to pay 100, but I will pay less and even less than what I have because there will be additional verification costs. Now, if I go for this phase value, how much can I raise today? It's essentially this area underneath, this lightly yellow area. And I can I put the phase value over there in this diagram, and I put on the x-axis, I put this area here, so how much I can raise. Now I can do an experiment and say, okay, let me put the phase value not here, but make the much higher phase value. How much can I raise then? I can raise this area. This is a much bigger area. Of course, I lose this triangle here, but I, you know, I gain this huge area, so I can actually from this, I move, I can raise more. I can shift towards the right here. If the phase value is so high, actually I can raise more of this. And I can do this for any phase value, and I can plot this for any phase value, and that's how much I can. I can raise, okay? So as I change the phase value, I move up the phase value, and here is how much I can raise. And it's the same diagram, I move up the phase value, and here the area is just plotted here on the x-axis. Now what's interesting is already that there's a limit how much I can raise, so if, if I have come, up, come in with in a debt, I have to refinance, which is larger than this amount, then I'm insolvent, okay? But if I'm in this area, then I'm solvent. Now, there's also a region where actually there are multiple equilibria. You can see already, for example, if I have this, I have to raise this amount, I can either raise this with this phase value, or I can raise it uh, with this phase value. Both will give me the same amount of funding I get now, but one, I have to offer a much higher phase value. Of course, it also leads to a much higher probability of default. Okay? And these are various things you can see in this region, there's multiplicity for if I have to raise so much amount, I can either raise this at the interest rate RB, that's this interest rate, or I, uh, you know, going up the same thing, I can raise this at a much higher interest rate. So I promise a much higher phase value, i.e. I promise a much higher interest rate, but if I do this, then I would default at a much higher probability because my default probability is, is so large. So I can nicely characterize the insolvency regions, the illiquidity regions, and that's the solvency region. Okay. Now, if I have a straight checker commitment, if I can commit to pay always the phase value, like here, so even if I don't have this interest, uh, the, the tax revenue, but I can do something to make it up, then I don't have this multiplicity at all. It just goes like a straight line. But I have the shortfall and I have to come up with some additional funds to cover up the shortfall. And one way to do that, to say, okay, if I, I have a shortfall, my tax revenue is X, and, but I, my face value is F, so if this is a shortfall, you know, then I have to really impose some draconian taxes, and this will be very costly. It comes with an extra cost of tau. Okay. So for very low realization of X, if I fall short this F, if I'm over there, I have some additional costs here. Now, now here's the difference in, in the two philosophies. So one philosophy is that, so what I should do, that's a, the French perspective, is I really would like to commit that I will pay back at any cost, okay, almost at any cost. Okay? So that's what I call this commitment cost C, okay? And I, what, how can I do that? I can say, I offer you my banking system as a hostage. So the way it works is that if something goes wrong uh, and I can't pay back my thing, I can, nevertheless, I can pledge it because I will actually give you my banking system and I cannot default on the government bond. If I were to default on the government bond, my whole banking system would go down and this will ruin my whole economy. So I will always pay these taxes, these draconian taxes, and pay this extra cost uh, in order to pay back the, the debt, okay? Hence you commit very strongly uh, and the more 
the banking sector is weak, the more it will be the case that actually you can commit your banking sector to repay your taxes and you keep a current interest rate low. Okay. So essentially what you have is you have this additional cost that if the shortfall becomes bigger and bigger as the tax revenue acts here, that's the tax revenue if it becomes is smaller and smaller, then it will be the case. Then you have to your ta the cost of paying this raising these extra taxes and paying it off is going up. And then, of course, there is this uh, the cost of uh, defaulting because you're ruining your banking sector. That's reflected here. And essentially, you will not go beyond that. You will still default on, on this region. So in this region, you will impose austerity. And in this region, you will default. Yeah. Now, as I mentioned before, so you have this diabolic loop where you have this bailout diabolic loop. There are two diabolic loops I would like to highlight. One is that there's a sovereign debt risk is more risky, hence the value of the bonds on the bank's balance sheet is, is lower. This means they have less equity, hence the bailout becomes more likely, sovereign debt risk is going up. But what you do is essentially, and you see this in the CDS spread and uh, for between bonds and the sovereign, they're highly correlated. So what you want to do is essentially you say, okay, I use this diabolic loop, and I use my banks as a hostage, and because it will be so terrible if the banks are going down, hence I will never default on my bonds. I will always impose these huge taxes and pay back. Okay? That's the, the French perspective, or I would say the Mediterranean perspective. Hence, we should not impose any risk limits or risk weights how much sovereign debt the banks can hold. Because these are the guys who will help out. They provide, essentially, banking sector gives the government a commitment device to pay back at any cost, okay, at an extreme cost. So the banking sector is essentially a hostage, i.e. a commitment device, for the government to commit to pay back its debt. And that makes it cheaper for the government to fund its debt, because uh, it offers uh, its bank as a commitment device. So if you use the banks as hostage, and we have this inequality, you can see that uh, increase the commitment cost. If I make the commitment cost more costly, so the banks will suffer even more, and the economy would suffer even more, this means the C cost is going up. This will shift this up. And you can see the default probability will go down. So the more I shift up the C, the more the default probability will go down. And this means a lower default probability. And a lower default probability means also this region where this verification costs are showing up is, is smaller as well. Okay? And the, the verification cost, that's a social loss. I cannot pledge, and I, I have to pledge more in order to raise some funds because of this verification costs. And this means if there are lower verification costs, I have a lower face value I have to offer, a lower interest rate will do, and I'm all better off. So it's lower default probability, I have a lower interest rate, and everything will be uh, better off. And this lower default probability that then actually leads again to lower verification costs, and essentially just there's a cycle cycling its, its way up. So that's essentially uh, a default probability is going down. But what's going, what's ignored here is that it's a doubling up strategy or doubling down strategy. I don't know what's the exact correct expression for that. Essentially, what you do is you increase the commitment cost, and as long as everything is fine, you get a lower interest rate today, but if you really have a very low realization here on the tax revenue, then you have to default nevertheless, and then you have to pay these huge costs. Okay? So you essentially commit, you put a straight jacket on, and you have some straight jacket commitment, but it could be that the realization is very, very bad, and then exactly then, you will have huge costs, and you have to suffer these huge costs because you can't get out of it anymore. Okay? If it really becomes one of the very, very low tax revenues, uh, realizations occur. Now, this is uh, coming already up if there's the banking sector use it as a hostage. Things become even worse if I take the second diabolic loop into account. The second diabolic loop says, it says if the banks are less well capitalized, they also don't lend to the economy anymore. Hence, the tax revenue, economic growth is going down, and tax revenue is going down. This actually makes things worse, too. So I have not only this outer loop, but I also have this inner loop, and that actually makes things even worse. Okay? So both of these loops 
make things badly. And what does this mean if I have the second loop active as well? This lowers GDP and lowers tax revenue. This whole box shifts to the left. So the, all this advantage I talked about earlier is actually not uh, arising here. Okay? Because now this box shifted to the left and the default probability is not getting smaller. It's actually because X, the tax revenue shift, the whole distribution shifts to the left. The default probability is actually pretty large. It doesn't get small at all. Okay? So the verification costs rise. The face value has to be higher, and the interest rate has to be higher, too. So if this di second diabolic loop, this GDP or credit diabolic loop, is also active, this whole mechanism is not working anymore. Okay. So the second, this credit GDP diabolic loop, can undo all the benefits. So taking banks as a hostage in order as a commitment device doesn't even work. It, it's a nice doubling up strategy, but it doesn't really work uh, if the second diabol diabolic loop is active as well. So that's essentially what, what I summarize here. So extremely high commitment costs uh, is like a straight checker commitment. It reduces illiquidity problems. It lowers the default probability and lowers interest rates. But it actually, if a really low tax revenue realization occurs, then it's actually you have to pay this huge commitment cost and the whole banking sector, the whole economy goes down. And it doesn't work really, this whole doubling up strategy doesn't work if the second diabolic loop is active, which, you know, meaning that if the banks are not so well capitalized, that don't lend to the real economy and tax revenue is going down, that makes things as well worse. Now, uh, let me just two, take two more minutes and then... Uh, so the challenge is for this safe asset challenge. The first one is uh, you have the safe asset and you, have this, you would like to have safe asset on the one hand in order to do monetary policy nicely and, and redistribute through monetary policy, but you also would like uh, to have some in extreme circumstances some sovereign debt restructuring without diabolic loop. Okay? And uh, that's in contrast to French and this restructuring is, I would say, uh, to the other perspective. Um, that, that's one challenge about the safe asset. The other challenge is that the, the, the safe asset might not be symmetrically dis supplied. You know? For example, in Europe, it is supplied mostly by Germany, by German Bund. But you know, whenever the crisis becomes more severe, I should have made an error too from Ireland as well, money is flowing out of, across borders, is flowing out from Spain, out of Italy, into Germany, out of Ireland, into Germany. Um, because of this flight to safety. Because the safe asset is not a European asset, it is a German asset. So there will be cross-border flights uh, because of this flight to safety. So ideally, what you would like to have, you would like to have an asset which is symmetrically supplied from the whole euro area. So as I mentioned, what happens if the crisis becomes more severe today, there's asymmetric shifts of capital flows across borders. And that's where this idea comes in, this, this ASPIS, where we actually propose the following. So what we propose is that you bundle in, on the asset side, you bundle up to 60% of GDP of the various countries. Of, you buy all a big fraction of the sovereign debt you buy up. And then you issue two bonds, a, a senior bond and a junior bond. Okay? The junior bond protects the senior bond. That's the idea. So there's no joint liability or anything. It's not a euro bond in, in a sense of joint liability. You just have a, a portfolio of sovereign bonds, and you issue a senior bond and a junior bond. And the junior bond protects it. So if there are losses on this side, it will eat up the junior bond first. And only when the junior bond is used up, then the senior bond will suffer losses. <laughs> now what happens now if there is a you know, financial crisis gets more severe? Would it be still the case that suddenly all the capital is flowing out of the periphery into Germany? No, because now it's a different channel. Now the channel runs, the capital will flow out of the junior bond into the senior bond. But both bonds are European bonds. Okay? So the idea is that instead of having capital flows across borders, you have it across these two tranches, the junior bond and the senior bond. So when the, you know, the value of the senior bond will expand and the value of the junior bond will shrink, but it's both, it's not across borders, but it is really going uh, across through European bonds, the junior bond 
and the European Safe Bond, the ESPs, the senior bond. Now let me conclude, so these are my final conclusion slides. Let me come back to the initial slide where we said, I think there's a different way of understanding things. The French way is much more flexibility in times of crisis management. The Germans are much more rigid with their rules. Uh, and there's some argument in terms of time consistency. And I should have also made in, with rules and all the independence of, of central bank is very important, again, in connection with the time consistency. In terms of solidarity versus liability, uh, the Germans are very much, you do some solidarity if the control is transferred. So if, if the control is separated, whoever is in control is liable for it. Uh, and you can't separate these two. That's with the spirit of the Nobela clause. That's, you know, you might have some sovereign debt restructuring and you might have some ESPs without joint liabilities, uh, but not a euro bond where here's a strong push for fiscal union. Uh, you would like to keep the illusion of default-free bonds, so the banks don't have to put any capital aside. And you might use this even, uh, the banks, as a hostage if needed in order to commit that you will repay, and this allows you some cheaper funding uh, at the moment. Whenever there's liquidity problems, whenever there are problems, it's because of liquidity and contagion. I showed that if you have contagion and systemic risk, the net present value of a bailout is always larger because the account of action of this huge contagion is much worse. For Germans, it's mostly a solvency problem if in doubt. And we talked about Keynesian stimulus versus austerity. Now, with respect to the financial aspects, it's all about bailing out banks or bailing in banks. And again, it also is the same distinction between illiquidity. You want to bail out. It's a positive NPV project, especially when contagion effects are large. Uh, you want to bail in. If it's an insolvency problem, uh, you go for a bail-in solution. But of course, as I mentioned earlier, it's not so simple, in particular if financial literacy aspects come into play. Uh, and then, essentially, also no default illusion. So you have to, you want to create the impression there's no never a default, and hence you can use um, monetary policy by changing the relative value of short-term money relative to non-defaultable long-term government bonds, and you put zero risk weights uh, on the government bonds in the bank's balance sheets, so they can hold as much uh, bank. As, long-term bonds, even though if they're not default-free. And the banks need something to hold some safe assets. So you say, OK, they can hold any government bond. Uh, and then you use the Stabolic Loop as a straight check commitment, or the banks as a hostage, to commit to pay back the government bond, not to default. But if you have to really default in very bad states of the world, you really will be in big trouble. The different aspect here is you allow for some debt restructuring, you put some positive risk weights on uh, the bank's um, sovereign bond holdings in order for the banks to have enough capital if there is some restructuring that they can survive it as well. Of course, you ruin this commitment power the banks can give otherwise. So let me uh, close with this and let me open up for Q&A. Uh, and I hope I gave you some overview of what this book is doing and what all the other research, how it all interweaves together. Two related points. I, I think at the start um, you, you make an assumption or at least an implicit assumption that both the French and the German objectives are identical. Our perspectives are identical. And I, I stick with this German-French dichotomy even though I, I agree, you know, it's the black and white was convenient. I actually think that Germans have in this, looking at this recent crisis, their view, their point perspective was really on the next crisis and avoiding it. Whereas I think the French were interested in dealing with the current crisis. And because of this difference in objective, I think they fumbled about and let this go on much, much longer. And I think that's important. Um, it's also important when you look at austerity versus uh, Keynesian stimulus. Uh, 
if I have to cut my expenditure because I have no money and nobody will lend me money, then I'm not austere, I'm broke. And I think that was the problem. We, you know, the, in the crisis countries, they weren't austere, they were broke. Mm -hmm. Germany, on the other hand, was, uh, was not broke and therefore they were austere and I think they will actually rule that, that uh, policy in, in the coming years because the electoral results recently showed that that's having some impacts in Germany as well. But that, that's really important in terms of the, the, the models you have put forward as well, whether they are models designed to solve the last crisis or avoid the next one. Yes, uh, I like this distinction. I mean, it goes a little bit hand in hand with the rules with discretion. Because if you have a rules framework, you always live in an ex-ante world, you know, because you won't like to commit to something today or convey some rules or something in order to affect the behavior in the next period or down the road, what you call in the next crisis. Well, if you lack flexibility, it's an exposed world, it, you're in a crisis already. So perhaps that's a better way to, to put it, saying, oh, living in the current crisis, dealing with the current crisis versus dealing with the, with the next crisis. Uh, and again, it's very consistent with this ex-ante perspective and rules and you know, setting a framework up versus uh, handling the current crisis in the exposed world. I also agree with you that uh, austere versus being broke, that distinction is, is valid. Uh, in particular, I think in Greece, it's true that any of these measures the Europeans did essentially made a sudden stop that the big suffered less extreme. I mean, it would have been way more harsh without the help uh, from the Europeans. And they didn't have, I mean, all the help they got they could spend. If they wouldn't have gotten any help, they would have been much more austere or much more uh, cutting back their expenditures much more dramatically. Um, I agree with that. So that's, it's a nice, Perhaps I should not call it austerity, I should I call it broke in a sense thing. Or there's no option, there's only... Well, let me put it this way, some German economists would say all the packages which went to Greece were actually help. they were not austerity measures, they were actually stimulus measures. Because without these packages, this would be much more harsh. It depends what your counterfactual is or your benchmark is. <laughs> So th thank you, Marcus, for a very uh, stimulating talk. Um, this question, I think, follows up uh, somewhat on Edgar's uh, first question. Uh, so I think your, um, your ideal types of the, uh, the French and, and, and German models is, is, is very useful. But I might just sort of suggest this, what I see as a certain sort of compromise between the models that took place uh, sort of during the crisis. And I, I think it became apparent during the crisis that liquidity problems, as you described them, uh, were uh, very serious, both for, for sovereigns and uh, for banking systems. And it became apparent that you did need uh, sort of strong sort of lenders of last resort, uh, both within countries and, uh, and between them, and, and probably more active uh, monetary policy to, uh, to aim at the kind of bottlenecks that you describe. Uh, but that the price that was sort of paid for sort of strengthening uh, the lender of last resort function uh, was uh, the strengthening of rules. So on the on the fiscal side, you had the six pack and the two pack and the fiscal compact, um, uh, and uh, on the uh, the the monetary and banking side, uh, you had uh, a move to greater sort of centralised uh, uh, supervision, and you could even, as you describe, uh, see uh, macroprudential policy as sort of dealing with the moral hazard uh, uh, problem. Uh, and maybe even austerity actually being sort of part of the, the price as well uh, of introducing uh, a stronger uh, lender of last resort. So just, it'd be good just to, just to hear your, your reaction if you see uh, that, that sort of compromise sort of taking place, and it might partly explain the sort of the shifts that you described, which are kind of going between sort of uh, bail-in to bail-out to bail-in as, as, as that compromise uh, becomes established. Yeah. yeah, that's, I mean, it's very much, uh, within the German philosophy in essentially saying that if you want more risk sharing, we have more of the control has to essentially has to shift to Brussels. You know, that's essentially you know, where the con whoever the decides about things has to be liable about it. And, and so this has to go hand in hand. And 
So that's very consistent. So what happened in terms of fiscal rules, I think the Germans pushed very hard on all these fiscal rules. This already in 2010. But then they became disillusioned in a sense. And that's why they shifted in the fall of 2010, they shifted gears towards uh, haircuts or towards uh, private sector involvement for Greece. Um, and this was a radical, so if you, I think, it's my understanding in the spring of 2010, it was all about, you know, let's strengthen the stability and growth pact, let's put fiscal councils where you're now sitting on, let's put all these things in place and make the system more and more complicated. And then they discovered a lot of resistance and it not, was not clear to what extent it will be implemented. And then they shifted the gears and said, okay, let's just uh, restructure the debt in, in the fall. And then the Germans were pushing very hard uh, against the French opposition to, to have this um, less stringent rules, but then we need market discipline through uh, potential uh, private sector involvement. Um, so I think that's, did I answer your question in this regard? So I think that's where, where the German side, I think, is coming from. The French side, it's, it's a little bit different. The way I see it is that um, they're actually willing to go for solidarity. They are very generous in this regard, but they're not very willing to pass on control to Brussels. So any budgetary power, any restriction, uh, it's all about the French sovereignty, and uh, they're very reluctant to do, that, to do that. And that's where the German side has big troubles with. I think the Germans would be willing to pass on some power, but it has to come from all sides and then also uh, accordingly enforced. Um. Any more questions? No? no? Okay. So I think I've just, uh, just a couple of things to do to, to, to just finish up. Just uh, once again, thank Marcus for a really interesting overview of a, of a, of a key piece of uh, research. Okay. So I, want, I want to thank you for all for staying for the ultimate end and uh, for having me. Thanks. Just uh, not quite the end. If anybody still has any energy, we, we have the AGM of the IEA kicking off straight after this talk. So if people want to hang around and find out what's been happening over the past year, everybody's, everybody's welcome to do that. And just, just to finish off, I just want to personally thank the people uh, connected with, with the organization and, and the, the, the smooth running of the, of the conference. I think that the, the technical side, it just went brilliantly. It was not a hit, so thanks, thanks very much for that. Likewise, the, the, the staff out of the fire, I mean, brilliant. Everything ran really smoothly. And finally, to, to Brendan and John on, a, on an excellent conference. I mean, it was, ju it was just wonderful to be at so many sessions that, that were standing room only. And it really was uh, just an engaging two days. You even made it stop raining in Galway for the two <laughs> days, which is, which is wonderful. So thanks to, to Brendan and John. Thank you.